Well, when you're freshwater fishing, there's a wide variety of different techniques you can use, and one of the most sensitive you can get for bites and seeing those bites is float fishing. In the fishing books, obviously, there's loads of different floats you can use, but there's one that's particularly sensitive when you're still water fishing. It's called the waggler float. So, to try out that waggler float fishing, I've come up to Bosaw Lake in Hampshire. Actually, there's two lakes here. Do a lot of match fishing up here, get some really big weights as well. It's a good, quiet place, peaceful, especially the top lake, which is called Bill Hook. Got a lot of lilies in there, nice coloured water, so they should feed right throughout the day. And Jim, the owner, has told me to come up, fish a peg along here, alongside some really mature lilies, and he reckons roach bream, and I guess the inevitable carp will make itself showing to us. Let's have a look along the lake and I'll show you how I'm going to feed. So there's trees, there's obviously match pegs all along here, there's like trees and shrubs every other peg so it's really sheltered you know up on a hillside probably can get windy but it's pretty sheltered, I haven't been here for about two years it's looking really really nice at the moment and basically I'm going to be fishing just out from the lilies, some lilies just close in here, really big thick mature beds, I bet there's some big fish underneath them I'm going to fish about three or four feet away from them, I don't be too close to them. And I'm going to be scattering just a little light ground bait and a few maggots. I've just got white maggots and see what we can catch. And he assures me, Jim, he said, when you hook a bream here, it flies out the water three feet. Now that I've got to see. So basically, I've set up just on the edge of these lilies. I'm about four or five feet to the left of the lilies. No doubt I'll get bites close to them, but I might lose a fish or two. I don't want that, I want to draw the fish away if I can. I'm going to be fishing a little light mix of uh, two mil ground up pellets, nothing else in it, very little small pellets, and white maggots just a dozen, half dozen at a go, regularly around the float. And hopefully I can get those fish bubbling and that'll tell me they're in the swim. I'm also going to fish my um, Avon rod with a quiver tip and a rod and a buzzer right under the bank, right close in, about two feet out. Basically because when I first turned up there, I saw like a swirl. And I thought, if somebody else has been fishing here, they might have dumped some bait in there. Chances are, I might pick a bonus fish up very, very close in. Let's get cracking. There is something about the English countryside when you're fishing with a float rod, a match rod, a light line, even when you're catching small fish like this. This one is just a skimmer. It's just, I don't know, it's sort of old school. It's very effective, but it is just an enjoyable way of fishing. That's as sweet and simple as it is. You need to have been float fishing most of your life to really have an appreciation for it. And it doesn't really matter how big or how small the fish is, when you hook them using a float and a float rod, it really does add a whole new dimension to your sport. Now listen, you don't have to go like the matchmen, very, very light as they do because they get lots of small fish, different species. I'm not in a competition. I'm only in a competition with the fish underneath the water. So in that respect, you can get away with something like a three pound hook link and not go down to very, very light hooks and hook links because there's no need to. In coloured water like this, I personally believe they can't actually see it. So why would you go so light, say down to a pound and a half hook link, something like that? Why not stick to something three pound minimum? Then when you hook the fish and get it in the net, you know you're not going to lose too many after that with fish like this. Well, with all those bubbles, 
might have been Bream, but unfortunately, or fortunately, it looks like the carp have moved in there. So fingers crossed, the Bream do get a chance, get a bit of a look in, but listen, great fish on a waggler float and a match rod. Here's a different species, more of the target species I was after. For some reason all that bubbling stopped and I've got myself, hold still, hold still, hold still, is a roach. There we go, not a big fish, but nice to catch nevertheless. Don't know whether I'm going to get them really going in here because if those carp come back, if I feed more, obviously I'm going to get more carp. So I'm trying to feed a little bit lighter, that's sort of the tip that uh, I've been told by matchmen, if you feed heavy, you'll get the carp move in. So I'm trying to feed as large as I can, which is difficult for me. I'm used to putting it in by the shovel fork. But wind's come up, it's dragging my float round. Might have problems with a waggler. I just hope it doesn't come on too strong because it's blowing left to right. And that either way, it's going to drag that waggler. Roach generally won't look at it. Might get the odd bream or carp, but I don't think the roach will take it. But hey, listen, we'll soldier on. I've had quite a few perch on the inside as well. In fact, let me just, let me just show you this. Tangled around the uh, tripod, just lowering it down the side. For some reason, I thought it'd be carp. Let's put that there. There you go. A little perch there. I've had quite a few of these small perch like this, just literally underneath the rod top. One thing with perch, keep your disgorger handy because you know with small perch, you're going to need it. With one of these, you can get it out quickly. There he is, a tiny weeny little perch. So that's three species, carp, roach, perch, all on the waggler. This one, just so you know, is a bunch of maggots on a size 12, one BB shot, pinch of ground bait, just lowered in and literally not even three feet from the edge of the bank. Now, on my float setup, I've got about, what's that? Four inches, I suppose, four inches. I've got a number eight shot there, that far from the hook. So that just hopefully rests and just stops the float moving. That's fine when there's only what we call a little bit of light wind drift, you know, just bit of drift going where there's anything stronger you might want to up that for say a BB shot something like that just something a little bit heavier to anchor it in position so while I leave my main float here with a locking shot you could also add a little piece here just to anchor the bait on the bottom and you won't disturb you know your actual shotting pattern if you weren't fishing hard on the bottom the more shot you put in on the float it's going to drag it under obviously but if you've got it set right and then you've got this on the bottom you could put an ounce of weight on there couldn't you being stupid you put an ounce of weight on it is on the bottom the float will still sit there because it's cocked with the shot under there so let's get this little chappy baited up and cast out i've only got white maggots in the thought that they might be able to see them better at this time of year it means nothing at all because it's so stirred up here where all the fish are in there I really don't think it makes any difference what coloured maggots you put on there. Always watch your overhead cast when you're fishing with a match rod because it's 13 feet long. It's quite long. I've already been up there. I don't think it's funny that I've been tangled up there. I don't think it's funny. I know where you live. Talking to you people again, honestly, the fish I've missed this year filming. Uh, I'll show you, I had three maggots on this one. These could be roach now. It's about three maggots, and they've pulled and stretched the other ones down. I'm just gonna have one last throw out here. In case that's a shoulder roach going through. I've missed it completely, talking to all these people on YouTube. So always be aware, overhead kids, whoo, up the tree, we've all been there, I do it occasionally, far easier. Just look up and just find the angle that you're going to cast out with a long match rod. Fingers crossed, 
that float goes under again. Well, guys, I didn't even see the float going under. I was looking around and heard the splash. I thought, what's that? It's one of the incredible jumping bream. I did wonder what the small bubbles out there were. There we go. Nice looking bream. Let's show him to you. I think he's done all his jumping. Well, there we go, people. Nice bream on the wagon float. Yet. Yeah another species and it's an incredible leaping jumping bream Jim was right didn't even see the the float go I just heard this splash as it leapt out the water well will we get another one I don't mind if we don't I've had a good bit of fun with that waggler float let's get rid of the last of this bait Okay, here's a tip. If you're looking for somewhere to target to keep your bait in the same area, so you're absolutely putting the float in the same spot. Indeed, this applies to sitting down, ledgering, any type of fishing. If you're standing up or you're sitting down, wherever you are watching that float out there, you want to find yourself a target. It could be a tree, it could be a pylon, it could be a bush on the opposite bank, providing you've got that distance to give you a reflection. If you've got a reflection, it doesn't matter which way the sun goes, that reflection is exactly the same. So where I'm sitting now, if I was to stand up, the float would be in the shiny patch, the glary patch. If I was to get down really low like this, it's in the dark patch. You want to keep casting and baiting up to the same spot where you're sitting like this. You know, work out where is a nice place to put the float. It might be you want it in the shiny patch or it might be that you want it in the dark patch, whatever's best for you but try and concentrate and get that bait and the float back in the same place. It gives you a much better chance of concentrating everything in one small area. It puts your chance of hooking a fish way up. There are so many bubbles in this swim. It's unbelievable that I'm not getting more bites. I don't know whether they are bream, whether they are roach, perch, or indeed the carp have come back. I've cast out a little bit further than normal. Now I brought the float back in. And once you get those small fish feeding, you get what we call the competition element in there. You can get a shoal of roach one after the other once you get them going and you get their confidence with feeding on what's called the little and often, which I've got to confess, I do have a great deal of problem doing because I like to throw in vast amounts of bait normally. I always have the misconception that it actually catches more fish when in fact it can have the reverse effect. Little and often is the way to get those fish feeding one after the other. There we go, this one is a skimmer, which is like a small bream. They call them in matches, they just call them silvers. You know, roach, small skimmers and stuff like that because they're sort of a match waking, making weight. Calm down, calm down, calm down. And you can also get hybrids between um, bream and roach, and they're really good scrappers. Get a lot of those in Ireland. But there is, if you hold still, which is doubtful, a skimmer on the float. I think that might, might also be moving in there. But we keep plugging away with it. Gradually building up a little catch. Not using the keep net, put them all back. And fingers crossed, my one pint of maggots, and that's all I've got. 
will hold out. Right again, guys. Definitely not a bream. Got to be a carp fighting like this. I still can't work out whether those bubbles are carp or whether they're bream with skimmers. And I have been told on good authority that actually perch do make bubbles as well within a swim. Single bubbles. This is a sort of setting that all anglers that love float fishing would give their right hand for. Beautiful lily pads, sun going down on a late autumn afternoon, and a match rod buckled in two. And a carp about to go in the lilies. Oh, he's kited left, luckily for me. I'll try and ease him in now. When I'm on small hooks, I try and go on backwind as well. Another one. Right, it's the dust. Well, people, I'm here. It's a beautiful evening, the sun's going down, it's getting cold now. Got my jacket on. And I've had my third flying bream from Bosor. Jim's just come round and he said, it's not just a few in there, he's put 2,000 in. And he said, I think they'd have had a couple of good breeding years on top of that. So there's no shortage of bream in here. And they all seem to fly. Well, 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 what a good little afternoon session on the float. I've got one on a ledger rod. To show you this one here briefly. So we were discussing the bubbles even with Jim. Don't really know which is which is the carp and which is the uh, bream. There you go. Oh, don't slime me, don't behold. No. Oh no, he's going to slime me. Come out again. Oh, I'm covered, absolutely covered in it. But there he is. That's a nice bream on a float rod. I think you'll agree it's some fine sport in some fine surroundings. Having said that, some pretty fine weather tonight. One of those last cast guys. And this time I bring that camera up for you. Quite a nice bream. A bow saw jumping bream. Just about to be netted. We can stretch out there. Get in. Get in. Oh yes. <laughs> These last casts are terrible, aren't they? Don't fly from me now. There we go people, lovely looking fish. I've had a really good session here, a pint of maggots. A pint of maggots and about half a cup of ground bait. That's all I've used. Waggler float, brilliant. Thanks for watching the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. Hit that subscribe button and check out Mike's Totally Awesome Outdoors channel. It's all free to watch, you know. <laughs>